welcome. It's great to have you here. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, Zakir Kul. Thank you and hello everybody. Greg, it won't help you to wave your hand. Just touch me on the shoulder. <laughs> <coughs> right, so the, the, the first element of transformation of the judiciary is of course appointments. And you must remember that in those days, judges were appointed by the minority apartheid government, uh, by the white people, and then by the minister of justice of that country. They appointed Afrikaner judges repeatedly. They appointed people, by and large, who would support them, who understand their point of view. They appointed people who were victims of apartheid, largely, who were beneficiaries of apartheid. And generally, the judiciary had a particular character, and a particular role, and a particular way. Amongst many, many of the judges in those days, rudeness and arrogance was considered to be a very proper thing to do. Intellectual sharpness and intellectual arrogance was considered to be extremely important. There were hardly any women in the judiciary, and the approach of the judiciary was very complicated in relation to different people. One found that African people were badly treated, generally speaking, that white people were treated better, that there were friendships between judges and, uh, and practitioners and so on. And I'll tell you a quick story about that, which was that we used to do um, uh, things in, 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 in rural areas. We used to go on circuit court. And one afternoon, we went for a walk at the hotel at which the judge, the prosecutor, my leader and I were living. And we walked around and found the judge drinking with the prosecutor. Having a good afternoon drink at 6.30 in the afternoon. And it was quite clear that it should not have been happening. Of course, he was very guilty and so on. And, uh, and said, well, um, uh, come and join us. And of course, we joined him for a drink. And just two cast some aspersions on the thesis that judges today are much worse than judges of, uh, of long ago. Some years ago, <clears throat> we walked to motion court on a, at 9.30 on a Tuesday morning or something to find that the court just wasn't in session. The judges came back at 11 o'clock and the rumors abounded and the rumors were sub subsequently confirmed that many of the judges in, throughout the country had at that time been fingered for taking subsistence allowances and so on and so on when they didn't need it. The answer to the problem in those days was not to discipline those judges, but simply to say that because the, 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 the judges did so because their subsistence allowances and so on were very high, then what they did was that they promptly increased their subsistence allowances in the hope that the problem would go away. <laughs> then this problem of impartiality must be worked through in some ways. Some judges were sympathetic to justice and gave judgment, uh, and, and there were a minority of them in those days, gave justice in accordance with a conception of justice when they could. Other judges did not. Some judges were partial to power, and other judges were not. Some judges were partial to, to poor people, and other judges were not. And, uh, and, and the problem was so severe that I once settled a case, a third party case, in which we agreed that if Judge A was the judge, they would pay us 250,000 rands. And if Judge B was the judge, we would withdraw our claim with each party to pay their own costs, and we would go home. Fortunately, Judge A was appointed, and we got 250,000. But it could have been the other way, and I have no doubt that there were cases where I took bets of this kind which actually went the other way and I've forgotten about them altogether. <laughs> <clears throat> so the problem with the judiciary was huge, quite apart from the fact that there were no women and so on. The other thing about it is that governments all over the world want judges of a particular kind. You see it in America, you see it everywhere. Some people think conservative judges are the order of the day. Some people think that intellectual uh, ability is the order of the day. Other people think that humanity and sensitivity is the order of the day. And these are all the debate which we need very carefully to confront when we are looking at transformation. The first thing that must be pointed out is section 174 makes it quite clear that it is necessary. Of course, the, the Judicial Services Commission must consider this factor. 
but that it is necessary for the judiciary to reflect broadly the racial and gender composition of our country. That is quite clear, and there's no doubt about that. Everyone will agree that where possible, there must be more women in the judiciary. Everyone will agree that where possible, there must be more African people in the judiciary, there must be that, 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 the, that the judiciary must be broadly represented. But what happens is that trouble comes about when we start applying the principles and trying to work out what to do. And what has come up is different people support different candidates who they think are wonderful without going into criteria and so on. And people start asking all kinds of questions about why a particular person was appointed as a judge. Now, in my view, many of the factors that existed previously continue to exist. It is quite clear, if you look at the composition of the Judicial Services Commission, that, uh, that there are, at the very least, uh, seven members of the African National Congress of the 24, 25 members of the bench. Over and above that, there are two uh, advocates from the advocate profession, two attorneys from the attorney's profession. They could come from anywhere. They might come uh, being, uh, they, they might be conservative, they might be non-conservative, non they might believe in women in the judiciary, they might believe that some judges are more active than others, and so on and so on. So uh, that, that, those are the two advocates and two attorneys. The president appoints, appoints four other people. Uh, there are um, five people, at the very least, who come from the opposition, and that's a very small number. So what I'm saying to you is that the process of the transformation of the judiciary means more than just the inclusion of women and African people, and that is becoming clearer. What we need to do, and that is important, as the basic minimum that, that we need to have, but we need more than that. I don't think that, uh, that that intellectual integrity, sorry, intellectual ability, the ability to make fine legal points is the main attribute to the appointment of a judge. In my view, what is the main attribute is the achievement of justice. In my view, one needs judges who understand the Constitution, who understand that their work as judges will contribute to the constitutional society, who understand the importance of human beings and humanity, who understand that they are actually judging human beings and who have a particular conception of justice. That being said, you've got a problem, you see, because everybody has a particular conception of justice. Everybody has a different view of how things should be done. So it may be that a particular government, let's take the ANC for example, might think that the Constitutional Court, for example, is getting a little too radical, and one needs to put this Constitutional Court in its place. And let's leave the race and gender competition out completely. I have been wondering on what basis a choice was made between two white judges who had the choice of being appointed to the appellate division. And I must say that the only distinction I could come to, and I may be wrong, the only important material point I could come to is that the person who went to the appellate division actually had been very critical of the Constitutional Court as it was. Now, quite obviously, if I were the government, and if I had the same criticisms of the Constitutional Court that this judge had, I would, and, and, and that would be my conception of how judges should behave, if I were the government and I thought judges should be more conservative, the judges we appoint should, should offend the separation of powers less, that the judges we appoint shouldn't be as radical as they are at the moment in the same way as many other governments think, then it is reasonable for the government to take that point of view, to instruct its members accordingly, and to ensure that that view is appropriately and pro properly propagated. That happens everywhere in the world, and we'll be leaving a fool's paradise if we think that that will not happen here. Whether we like it or not, big business doesn't like uh, judgment being given against them. Poor people don't like judgment being, being given against them. Government doesn't like gov judgment being given against them. And in a constitutional or order, the danger of constitutional <coughs> giving judgments against government are very real. 
judges differ on that, people would differ on that, and therefore it will happen that that judges will be appointed. How do we how do we avoid this problem? How how do we make sure that in an arena where there are so many subjective factors? where 25 people are exercising their minds on a particular issue, when there's need for transformation at every level, more women, more, 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 more people of other races, judges who are more humane, <laughs> judges who consider poor people carefully, judges who ensure that justice is done, and justice too is a particular conception, because the government will have one conception of justice, I would imagine that every person in the 25 person judicial services commission would have their own conception of justice. They'd be persuadable one way or the other. So you have these things, and how do you fit in also the go governmental requirements of a certain degree of conservatism? This government is no different. It doesn't want judgment being given against the, against the Minister of Health because of all the nonsense that occurs in the Eastern Cape and all over the place. It doesn't want judgments to be given against third party company, against the multilateral fund or whatever it is called now, so that the fund becomes bankrupt. It's like an end to all this. It's like these damages claims to stop. No government wants repeat the damages claims to be awarded against the police and so on. So I think that we must be realistic about this. That there is a limit to transformation, that the reality of politics the reality of government, the reality of the constitution and, and, uh, 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 and the fact that certain judges are a threat to government as perceived by government itself, and other judges are not, necessarily means that the government will try and get its own way. The only way in which, I, and we must recognize this as an absolute reality without going into personalities and so on. The only way to avoid this is for us all to contribute to the idea of developing appropriate criteria for the appointment of judges, which 25 people would apply. There's a difference between everybody doing their own thing and thinking about things and being persuaded by each other and going according to their own notions of what what, what judges should be, on the one hand, but a set of criteria as objectively as we can define them. And I understand people who say, well, people will interpret criteria differently and so on. I have no trouble with that either. But we are less likely to get into a situation where we have inappropriate appointments or appointments which go this way and that without uh, which, which demonstrate inconsistencies at one level or another, if we begin to develop very carefully criteria which people, must, uh, which people in the Judicial Services Commission must apply appropriately and properly. And my own view is that the challenge is in developing the criteria, but one must understand that if we develop the criteria, we will lessen the problem, but we will not eliminate it completely <coughs> because differences of opinion will always be there about who a good judge is and who a good judge is not. However you apply the criteria, you will have these differences. Whatever you do, any government anywhere in the world would want to constitute a court in a way which offend the way in which the government wants to do, do things as little as possible. Let, let us recognize this all quite clearly and see how the development of appropriate criteria will help us resolve the problem. Problems of poor people not getting judgment, uh, judgments in a court, problems of pro justice not being done, problems where poor people are ignored and not properly catered for, and so on. So the sooner, in my view, we start developing these criteria and continue to develop them and continue to evaluate them in an, in an effort to render what is essentially a totally unmechanical process as objective, as careful as we possibly can make it, 
and develop a culture in which government too begins to understand that 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 the conception that that uh, uh, judges who rule for authority are necessarily better judges is not necessarily a correct one. Thank you very much.